Hi, my name is Heba, and uh, this is Tate and Mohammed, and we're from the working group of uh, post-colonialism today. To me, what's really unique about this project is because it's coming from this very uh, pressing current need to think about alternatives. So to be able to escape the neoliberal normativity that we live in um, across Africa, but even in the entire world, by looking at African history uh, has been really inspiring to me. Our challenge in our project is to see how that knowledge can help us meet the challenge of the current context. But we're also aware that the things have changed. Hmm? And the condition within which those policies were implemented or developed and formulated in the post period are not the same. In order to make sure that we are able to process these policies firm effectively for our times, the tools that we have applied, which is for me, makes me very excited about part of our project, also not simply recover the policies, but ask how we can improve them to fit for our purpose. The objective was to reverse the colonial project, which as you all know, involved the low value primary production for exports and the importation of free high value products for the colonial power and others. That was the nature of the colonial project as we know it. But it went beyond that. And therefore, the, the, the first task was to reverse this. And this was to be done using state power in an interventionist manner, strengthening vocational and technical education, building new universities. All of these were part of the educational uplift, which was seen as part of the struggles, but also critically, the attempt to diversify the economy towards industrialization and the mechanization of agriculture in the case of Ghana. And there was calls of state-owned enterprises and so on across the board to capture the key points of the national economy and to turn away from primary production as the main source of revenue and therefore of development. The balance that the Nasserite industrialization policy struck between being a state-led uh, industrialization process that managed to not get mired in the minutia of industrialization, even though it controlled most of the industrial production in Egypt, it kept its interference to the larger establishments, to the massive factories that we see employing hundreds and thousands of people and allowing these factories to depend on small workshops that are usually privately owned to supply the small parts and components that they need. The permeation of industrialization in the Egyptian society, I think that would be a good thing to bring back. That the state interferes, yes, establishes industrial establishments and lets the people kind of manage how that permeates into their daily life. In the end, they all came to the same broad sets of interventions, which included essentially um, an agreement on the central role that the state would have to play in the process of post-colonial development. In terms of uh, policy instruments, they were all interventionist in their fiscal and monetary policies. When unpacked, the kinds of tariff policies they pursued, kind of interest rate policies they pursued, kinds of exchange rate policies they tried to defend. Important because this also underpins the uniform commitment across the board to an import substitution strategy. All this uh technocratic analysis uh, about uh, new, new, new liberal globalization and uh, 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 yeah. economics, competition, free trade. Mm. All this uh, uh, on knowledge is now collapsing yeah. because they, they have failed mm. to make uh, our uh, uh, world uh, better. Mm. As they say, they, they say that the greatest trick that the devil pulled was to convince everybody that it didn't exist. Uh, we might say that the greatest trick that neoliberalism pulled was to convince everybody that power and distribution didn't matter in economic affairs. And that all you have to talk about is the rational, free, calculating amount of the market. And I think all the projects, you, you were as much as about how to, do we recapture of African agency, 
we were able to do to, to have control of, even if we have done mistakes, but we had control about what we do. The fact is that now, with all neoliberalism, the World Bank, etc., all our capacity to think from ourselves and to have the capacity to plan from ourselves were reduced and uh, weakened. I think this is a, a very important question we have to, to discuss because this, I think this story tells a lot about our situation now. But uh, we are uh, taking advantage of uh, a feminist uh, approach and uh, interpretation of the, the way society uh, uh, works. Thinking about these policies as they relate to the social forces, right. to social reproduction, to family relationships, to gender relationships, is a key component of this research because we're not thinking about policies in vacuum. Uh, I'm part of this uh, post-colonial today project, uh, looking at um, development planning in Ghana and Tanzania. And I must say that uh, looking at these two plans, um, I've been uh, overwhelmed by the state's own central position in development planning. That also presupposes that then the state determines a certain kind of citizen and how to respond to the needs of the citizen. So it is important, but then we also need to redefine this communal ownership because the kinds of communal ownership that are defined around the continent is situated within the patriarchal norm about male having better access than women. Even though this uh, communal ownership sometimes is seen as more egalitarian than the World Bank induced uh, private ownership. I, I still insist uh, uh, that there's need for, for states to redefine different forms of, of power relations. We can talk about international capital uh, power relations, but then also we want to talk about internal power relations. Internal power relations are about traditional sources of power and also uh, gender relations and what it means for access. What is very important about our projects is the fact that we are trying to empower civil society and activists. And uh, we are doing, doing it in such a way that we are trying to benefit from uh, the experience of older generations, yeah. trying to build a kind of uh, uh, interaction and uh, inter exchange between younger and uh, uh, older generations. Those of us who form the Tanzania Media Women's Association um, were products of an education system under Nyerere. Mwalimu to us was larger than life. It is that era which painted to our ideology as young students the whole concept of Pan-Africanism uh, and Pan-Africanism at a political level, not economic. And uh, our romance with leaders like Gamal Abdul Nasser and uh, Nkuruma, and then also the ideology of South-South cooperation. That era was so different. It mobilized us just you know, like the South African Liberation Movement totally mobilized us, okay? They were there, they were alive, we were involved, you know, and as young people, it impacted us. What is there now? What is there now that, that uh, drives young people? What is it that they can inspire, that inspires their whole being? If you look at the different activists who are currently in the project developing papers to respond to specific needs, they are in very different national contexts. They all face similar challenges, but some can take uh, their recommendations directly to their governments. Others would take them directly to unions they work with, and others can even think of regional organizations. This project is a is a I, I think a growing toolbox, uh, and it's growing because of its participants. They are making it uh, grow. And th that defines it more than an, a, a research or any other sort of engagement. It's, it's, an, it's a political and activist project. Mm -hmm.